Michaela mentioned a number of um, types of AR solutions um, uh, and categories. Uh, one other way of categorizing it is uh, the type of display that you're using because it very, very much affects your, uh, your experience. Uh, and what you saw uh, in, in that presentation were, was mostly video-based. We use a camera to capture something around this, the, the environment. The computer superimpose uh, graphics on that and then presents you with a video image with that uh, composition. And I'm going to show you at one example that, that uh, is, is more optical where uh, it all coexists. And you understand when I get to that. Uh, so my passion uh, in, for AR and user interfaces comes from uh, about a decade of work in different research labs where I focused on a new type of interaction technology and interaction techniques uh, where it uh, starts with looking at how to develop new uh, display systems and display components, uh, various forms of sensing, mobile devices and physical objects in, in the surroundings, and then use that, that new technology to build uh, novel forms of interaction techniques and user experiences around that. So today, I'm going to talk about one example that is uh, uh, has a specific uh, use case. And I want to start with a question. And the question is, what if you had, and you were able to go to the store right now, and buy a thin piece of glass that is completely transparent, uh, that you can put really anywhere uh, of your choice, in your workplace, or at home, or really wh wherever. And this piece of glass would be able to interpret what's behind it. So you're looking through this, this glass, and it would actually be able to understand what's happening on the other side, and be able to overlay and superimpose information in real stereoscopic 3D that would help you understand or explain uh, things to you that you cannot see or you could not uh, understand uh, just with your naked eye. So think about that for a second. And the important thing here, uh, when I'm starting out with this question, is it uh, very much focuses on the user experience. It's not about the technology, it's not my flashy phone or my flashy tablet. It's really uh, what, what do I, I want to solve or what do, what do I want to achieve or experience. And it doesn't matter whether, whether that's a handheld device or, like in this case, uh, some projectors that are installed. But we took this, uh, this vision and at maybe a, a little bit less sexy uh, use case. Uh, so this is a big um, lathe in the Department of Production Engineering at KTH in Stockholm. Uh, it's a two-ton machine that's very complex. Not everyone has this in their homes and probably won't for a long time. Uh, so a, a lathe, also known as Svarv in Swedish, uh, consists of uh, some basic components. So you have a, uh, a tool that can move in 3D uh, inside this workspace. We have a workpiece that spins very fast, and as this tool hits this workpiece, it cuts into this material, is able to sh make a different shape. So I, I think some people might have, in their um, high school, made like uh, little light stands. Uh, that's kind of a typical thing. Um, so. For lathe, uh, there's an industrial lathe, there's, there's always a control computer that you can load with a program that controls how fast things are moving, where they're going, and basically a set of instructions to sort of carve out this uh, material. And this control computer not only steers what's happening, but also reads out a lot of information. So uh, rotation speed, pressure, temperature, a lot of information that is essential uh, and sort of adjusts what's, what's going on. And the third uh, component here is, is the human, the operator. And the operator is very interested in, in what's going on inside this uh, machinery and wants to, wants to get all this information from the process uh, to the left, but at the same time wants to see how things are moving. For instance, if uh, you're cutting too fast with too much pressure, uh, the tool might break, for instance. So uh, this is a classical AR dilemma, uh, sometimes referred to as schizovision. You have to look in two places at the same time. Very hard, at least with normal vision. So. What if we could take this process information and really fuse that with the workspace 
so that this operator would just have an augmented experience that he did not have uh, any conflicting uh, scenario. And our Aster system that, that was developed with KTH uh, is based on a piece of technology that allows us to do just this. And this is based on a, um, on a holographic optical element uh, created by um, Jonny Gustafsson, which was uh, my colleague back then. Uh, and he spent many, many years of research into uh, the optics of this. And this holographic optical element is, is very interesting because it has a number of properties that uh, really allows it to be used for very, uh, very diverse um, use cases. Uh, so it's essentially this sheet of glass with a very thin film on top of it that has been optically programmed to bend and shape light that hits it. And, and we can program this, this sheet. It's a one-time process. We can program this sheet to, um, to ref reflect light such that we can create the illusion of 3D inside. So the first thing that uh, we can do down here is to separate how the light from multiple projectors that illuminate this sheet, how it comes back uh, towards you as, as a user. So the first thing is that it allows us to use two projectors shining at the same place, but uh, the left eye will only see the light from one projector, and the right eye will only see the light from the other projector, so you, get, you can create the illusion of, of depth with stereoscopic vision to create two images. The other thing that's, that's critical for, for AR is that you have this transparency. So this, uh, this element has been made to be um, wavelength dependent, so it reflects uh, red light very brightly, as you see here, but the rest of the screen is completely optically transparent, just like you used to uh, in the real world. Uh, and at the same time, it also provides full resolution. So you might have seen some of these autostereoscopic displays that are on sale right now. Uh, they actually, the more views you have, so if you have one person, you actually have half the resolution for each eye because you're competing for the same, uh, for the same pixels, whereas in this case, it's taken care of optically, so you have full resolution for one eye. And the last property is that it can also be controlled in terms of viewing angles. So unlike a mirror or any other material where you shine light and the incident light comes out at the same angle, uh, this can be uh, controlled such that you have a pretty steep projection angle, but you have a very comfortable viewing angle straight on. So we took this, um, uh, this optical component and mounted it, uh, integrated with the safety glass of, of this lathe. And then we built a system that interfaces with the lathe to read out all the uh, real-time inf information, feed that to the projectors that illumi illuminate uh, this, this HUE and uh, create a complete fused experience. I'm going to show you a video of, of that in action. <clears throat> so what you're seeing here is um, all the red graphics is from, uh, from our display. And what you just saw is the tool moving in 3D. Uh, and here you have the, the, the actual work piece that we're cutting into. And what we're seeing overlaid is the three components and the resultant of the forces that are actually measured in real time on the tip of the tool. So as we're cutting, uh, we see, we get a direct feedback on what's going on. And here we have the feed that controls how much uh, the tool is push, pushing into uh, the workpiece. So the more pressure we're pushing it into, the bigger the forces are and, and vice versa. And And there's, of course, other information that we can superimpose in, in 2D, uh, like the, the program uh, running the various parameters and so on. And, and one thing that, that is also not evident from the video, of course, is that it's really stereoscopic. So you get the, the real depth experience where these, the, tip, I mean, the forces are really following the, the tip of the tool in, in the 3D space. And this is, is, is actually interesting because it, it if you're imagining that you're cutting inside or behind something, you still have that stereoscopic cue with the graphics you see where that is a sort of a, 
um, sort of a, a way of getting X-ray vision with this. Um, another aspect of this um, the system, and it comes back to the uh, to the properties uh, of how it's designed, is that it's really, it really was made to not interfere or, or alter the way that this operator works with his machinery today. Uh, as you see, it's, it sits on top of the safety glass, it's fully transparent. If you do not want this experience, you can just step out, out of the viewing zone and you have, again, your direct uh, clear view. Or you turn off the projectors and, again, nothing interferes. I think that's one of the key components that we forget sometimes with AR, that we're sometimes just altering our experience, getting augmented reality through a small uh, mobile viewport down to the resolution of the camera and to the capabilities of the camera when we have like a, a very rich environment around us. And, but not everyone has, has the possibility to install something like this. Other things that we are uh, and have been uh, exploring uh, in this concept of um, this astro display is to add uh, ways to interact with the content. So we've uh, integrated uh, touch overlays, so you can also interact through the glass, uh, 3D cam cameras to sense gestures. So this is a system uh, that predated uh, Microsoft Connect, but a company that Microsoft actually bought. Uh, and eye tracking to get motion parallax as you're moving in front of this display. And this one we're using very nice from Swedish company, Toby. And we've, we use these, uh, th these devices to uh, explore interaction with in the Top right, uh, we see a 3D scan from sculptures um, that were found on the, the Vasa battleship that are now being scanned for preservation. So what if you could still visualize and interact with them without having to uh, expose the real artifacts or you, you wanted to see them in multiple museums at the same time. And in the bottom picture, we have a surface reconstruction from a medical CT scan. Uh, so how could we interact with that uh, without having to touch anything in a sterile medical environment? Uh, so, so this is one example of a hybrid user interface where uh, we have a number of, of things that we're combining to achieve uh, a sort of transparent or invisible interface as, as a user experience. Uh, so the first thing is bringing in novel display technology that allows us to think a little bit differently about uh, what we can do and what we can experience. The other thing is to push out the sensing into the environment. I don't want to wear necessarily, necessarily something on my body. This is very intrusive right now. It's kind of odd to have this little thing hanging in front of me. Really, in 2011, can't we have uh, a system that can uh, listen to me and track me and uh, amplify me to, um, to, to the room and to the internet without this little boom. It's kind of weird. So what if we could put, put all the sensing in, in the environment and then take these sensors, these displays and the interaction uh, to have, have this combined transparent experience. And actually, a lot of this work has been ongoing in the research community for about 25 years. So in, in a lot of the pioneering work in augmented reality, uh, ubiqu ubiquitous computing, tangible user interfaces, spatial aware handhelds, uh, people have already explored this. But I think that now is, is the time where we actually have off-the-shelf components, things that we can uh, pretty easily integrate and sort of build on. Uh, and, and also we have like th this infrastructure and connectivity that was really not available back then. So it's very exciting from that point of view. Um, and in our work, we're continuing to explore these hybrid user interfaces. Um, some use cases are to enhance interaction with the existing displays. So like here, we have um, a mobile phone that's tracked on a rear projected display that has limited capabilities, but a mobile device actually has a better screen, high resolution screen in its density, so we can sort of have a movable viewport to amplify our experience there. Uh, at MIT, we just um, launched this project where um, we're tracking a mobile device through a novel uh, sensing capability. Uh, we were looking a lot at sensing and augmenting objects on tabletops. And, of course, for collaboration. So how could we really 
amplify the collaboration and communication between uh, users uh, across distances with different devices and so on. And for instance, in uh, teleradiology, uh, having surgeons giving second opinions from uh, hospitals that are distributed uh, all over. So coming back to this question, you know, what would you do with this transparent piece of glass that could uh, understand and interpret and, and visualize things for you? I'm sure you have lots of ideas. Uh, this was just one example that I showed you with the industrial machine. And I would really love to hear uh, for the next two days if you have ideas or questions or comments around this that you would like to, sh like to share. So I thank my, uh, a lot of collaborators and funding agencies, of course. And, uh, you can find a lot of my videos at olval.com, and thank you so much. <laughs>